So let's start. Um, welcome to the weekly colloquium of the C3.AI Digital Transformation Institute. So the goal of our institute is to promote the dig digital transformation of business, government, and society through the use of artificial intelligence, cloud computing, and machine learning. Uh, our institute is uh, funded by a generous grant from C3.AI and computing support from Microsoft. And we have a number of universities and national labs as our partners. Uh, in addition to today's uh, symposium, we have uh, symposiums, I mean, talks lined up uh, uh, in the colloquium series for the rest of the spring semester. Um, I'm not going to go through the names of all the people here, but um, we have talks all the way through May uh, and we'll continue through the summer as well. If you are interested in going back and looking at some of the uh, older talks, you can always go to our YouTube channel you can search for C3.AI Digital Transformation Institute and you'll get to our channel and all our talks from both the, from, from this colloquium um, uh, series as well as our workshops and our research symposium. All of them are available on the YouTube channel. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, our second call for proposals is out now. Um, so this call will be on the use of AI for energy and climate security. Uh, we have listed a number of topics here within this call, but of course, you're also welcome to propose on other topics related broadly to energy and climate security. Uh, I strongly urge you, if you're interested in uh, submitting a proposal to this second call, I strongly urge you to go to one of the information sessions, uh, which will be uh, conducted by Tandy Warno and Costa Spanos, who are our two uh, chief scientists. And these will be on February 15th and 17th. And in addition, we also have uh, information sessions uh, telling you about our computing resources. I mean, one of the unique things about our institute is that we make um, uh, computing resources, both from C3.ai and Microsoft available, as well as uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, as well as NCSA. So we make them all available to um, um, people who are funded by our institute, researchers funded by our institute. And there will be a, a information session about the computing resources on February 19th, 23rd, and March 2nd. These will be very useful when you formulate your proposal so that you can be fully informed of the computational resources that we make available when you write your uh, uh, proposal. In addition, our, the C3 uh, DTI development operations staff, I mean, I'm meaning the software engineers, will be available for office hours uh, between uh, 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific time uh, between um, February 9th and March 2nd every Tuesday. And that's another opportunity for uh, proposers to find out more about the computing resources that we make available. And, and this time around, we are, making, uh, um, uh, we are making available their resources in a unique way. So for proposers, you, you, could, you, could, make, uh, you could embed one of the C3.AI DTI development staff in your project and you can write in your proposal that this is how uh, you know, we'll be using them. And of course, if, if, the, if the development staff agree to it, so you can make them part of your project and uh, that, that'll, that'll be available at no cost to the proposers. So, so you can go to the office hours for more information about that. And finally, about the second call, I guess the proposals are uh, due on March 29 uh, at 11.59 PM Pacific. Uh, daylight time. And uh, for details, please visit our website. So regarding today's colloquium format, there will be a 40 minute presentation followed by a 15 minute Q&A. And please use the Q&A feature to ask questions. You can upload questions you like. And of course, if, if a question receives more upvotes, then we'll ask them first. And we'll try to answer as many questions as time permits. Uh, so th today the talk will be, uh, the title of the talk is Triaging of COVID-19 Patients from Audiovisual Cues. I believe there will be three speakers today, but the principal investigator for the project is Professor Narendra Ahuja. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Narendra. Narendra was one of my uh, graduate school advisors, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce him. Uh, he, he was a longtime uh, professor uh, in my department, the Electrical Engineering, Computer Engineering Department at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he's now a research professor. He's an expert on many things in AI, including computer vision, pattern recognition, machine learning, image processing, and their applications 
including problems in developing societies. He has co-authored a large number of journal and conference papers, um, supervised 50 PhD students and many masters, undergraduate and postdoctoral scholars. He received his PhD from the University of Maryland in 1979, and he's a fellow of many distinguished societies, including the IEEE, the AAAI, International Association of Pattern Recognition, uh, ACM, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the International Society for Optical Engineering. Uh, Narendra, please. Please go ahead and share your screen, Narendra. Uh, we can't hear you. I don't know if you're muted or you haven't started speaking. Can you hear me now? Yes. Screen visible? Yeah, yes. Okay, great. So let's start. <clears throat> so this talk is about, as Shrikant just said, this talk is about uh, handling the the COVID patients, you know, the number of surges. So we'll, what we'll do is uh, let me first uh, start with, so this is our team. Uh, I'm the PI, my area is vision. Uh, then my co-PIs are David Beiser, uh, who will be speaking next. Uh, he's uh, in emergency medicine, but also has a lot of engineering background. Uh, David Chestek, emergency medicine informatics. I believe he is in the, you know, on some uh, duty through throughout the day, so he may or may not make it. Uh, Professor Mark Hasikawa Johnson, my colleague at UIUC, uh, he's, he works in audio. And finally, Jerry Krishnan from UIC, he's an expert in pulmonary uh, diseases. <clears throat> so this is our team. So what we'll do is we'll start with, uh, with, uh, the uh, problem that motivated this in the context of C3.AI Digital Transformation Institute's uh, interest in COVID-19, obvious interest in COVID-19. So uh, let, me, uh, let me hand it over to David Beiser, who is among the people who have been, they have been dealing with this thing, so they know exactly what the problem is. So let me, David. Hi, thank you, Narendra. Next slide, please. Next slide. So as uh, Narendra mentioned, um, I'm an emergency medicine physician at University of Chicago and have been uh, treating patients, including COVID patients uh, for the last uh, year almost at this point. As we know, the COVID pandemic is, um, doesn't appear to be uh, abating quickly. Uh, we, we're seeing kind of decreases, local decreases in positivity rates here in, uh, in Illinois, uh, but you know, we've got variants and other, um, you know, we've got variants circulating that suggest that we might be in for a, uh, a long kind of chronic phase for this pandemic. So uh, we got together uh, around this idea of kind of, uh, of how we might kind of contribute as a multidisciplinary group. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Yeah, uh, David, I have I can see my next slide, but for some reason you are not seeing it. It seems I cannot I cannot see it. Maybe go one one more. Okay, let me see one more. Does that do anything? There you go. So okay, COVID has had many effects on kind of uh, on on the hospital. Um, and uh, I guess we'll just, yeah, you know, it has definitely contributed to uh, uh, increase in emergency department volumes at, at some places, at some centers. Uh, we've also kind of recognized a new type of kind of respiratory patient. And these patients really uh, have a very fast and somewhat unpredictable decompensation 
uh, clinically uh, that can happen kind of right in front of us in the emergency department, but can also happen at home. And so we would have patients showing up uh, in extremis uh, who had been uh, recently discharged. Um, these patients tend to be older, sicker. They come from disadvantaged populations. Um, they're, you know, with, with little access to, uh, to, to healthcare resources often. And like I said, predicting when they are gonna decompensate is a very difficult problem. Next slide, please. One more slide, thank you. So the initial response to the pandemic was probably, I would characterize it as one of the most creative kind of times that I've ever seen in medicine. Um, one of the most adaptive and creative moments in, in, in modern medicine to some extent, uh, where we saw all sorts of innovation. Um, and, but on the very kind of mundane pedestrian level, you know, we needed to increase the capacity in the emergency department. And so uh, that often came kind of by developing improvised spaces, whether that uh, for, for many places, it might, might mean putting up a, a tent outside of the emergency department to see extra people. We actually uh, open up an area um, within uh, a built out area within kind of a parking lot structure um, uh, that uh, became kind of our, our, our rapid kind of COVID unit where we would see hundreds of patients um, in, a, in a day. But there was also many negative kind of externalities to this, including, you know, within the hospital to uh, empty out the hospital, the hospitals canceled elective surgeries, this resulted in revenue loss, outpatient visits kind of were canceled um, across the board. Once again, more revenue loss for the hospital and decreased primary uh, uh, care activity, which resulted in layoffs many times, but also uh, salary freezes or salary decreases um, uh, for, for, for me and many of my colleagues. But not only did the this have an impact on the hospitals, but also within the population itself, especially here on the south side. We saw, um, eventually, we saw decreased emergency care um, happening for non-COVID-19 uh, diseases. So suddenly, we weren't seeing heart attacks. We weren't seeing people with, with, with asthma attacks or heart failure. Um, we really have no idea what happened to those patients, OK? Um, but we do know that we saw also my primary care colleagues um, were no longer seeing their patients. They lost touch with the, many of their patients. We stopped doing health, routine health screenings that have really, you know, over the last few decades have really um, improved the health of our society. Suddenly we stopped being able to do these. We don't really know what happened with the, with the true impacts of these, um, of this decreased amount of care really is at this point. This, is, this will be worked out in the next few years as, as we kind of go through the, the data. But we do know that at least immediately, um, looking through kind of our immediate rearview mirror, we had a 50% increase in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And cardiac arrest, are, you know, that's really the final common pathway for many of these diseases like, like heart disease. Um, next slide, please. So a couple of months into the pandemic, I, uh, we all, uh, we realized that telemedicine, which is really the delivery of care across, you know, kind of remotely, usually with a live connection with a provider um, could be a game changer. You know, of course, you know, there, there was traditional telemedicine, but we started thinking about telemedicine in different ways. So for example, using telemedicine as a way to connect with our patients after we discharge them. So COVID positive patients um, that we were a little bit unsure about, we, we put together pathways and many of our peer institutions did the same thing where we could follow up with them via telemedicine you know, for the next few days afterwards. Our primary care providers embraced telemedicine. Urgent cares were starting to use 
telemedicine and prescribing medications without ever seeing a patient face to face. Um, psychiatrists were using it uh, to, uh, to assess their patients, uh, therapists using it to deliver therapy. Um, my wife moved her, her therapy practice to, you know, to our bedroom, all right, and has been providing uh, therapy for the last, uh, last year. We also started using it for uh, consultants that did not want to be exposed, you know, our specialty consultants, our surgeons and, and, and others who didn't want to come down to the emergency department and potentially be exposed uh, to COVID. Uh, and some centers experimented with using telemedicine uh, uh, in the triage areas of the emergency department. So to, in order to separate providers, especially some of our older providers uh, from patient exposures. Next slide, please. So telemedicine has been around for a very long time. Uh, when I was in medical school, telemedicine was, was beginning to take off, uh, but the adoption really has been, has been glacially slow. Um, and that's due to a variety of factors, regulations, both like within state and between states having to do with licensing. There've been uh, technical hurdles. Uh, of course, the perceived med, med, med legal risks and, and, and HIPAA risks of taking care of patients across kind of uh, a, 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 a telelink uh, system. Um, but I think ultimately, the thing that really drive, it drives it would be kind of the payment model. The payment model um, uh, didn't work because payers weren't willing to, to pay for it. So if, if we can't get it paid for, nobody's going to do it. But in the background here, there are other things. And these are also probably equally important to the payment models. This physician attitudes towards telemedicine and their thoughts about the limitations, the inherent limitations of, of, of telemedicine. And finally, patient attitudes, you know, the, um, as they think about kind of getting quality care, um, you know, they're um, having kind of, um, thoughts that a telemedicine appointment could not provide the same as a, as an in-person live appointment. Next slide, please. 8020 rule. So there's this rule in medicine, the 8020 rule, where we, we, we say, you know, 80% of the diagnosis is in the history, which is great. It's great for telemedicine, right? So all I need to do is have a discussion and I can, and I, and I've, got 80% of the information. But that last 20%, as with every kind of thing we do in life, is still pretty darn important, right? And that's usually the difficult part um, to get. And so we've got 80% in the history, but 20% of it is in the physical exam. And there's some of it that's also in the in laboratory values and things like that. But it's really 80% in the history, 20% in the exam. And with telemedicine, we've got lots of subjective data. We can see what, what you look like. We can see, you know, do you look like you're uncomfortable? We can see your, your home. Um, does the home seem chaotic? Does it seem safe? We've got all the subjective data and some of it's new, right? I've never been, I've never really known kind of anything about my patient's home life. And suddenly I do, and that can, that might be able to help me with a diagnosis. But regarding objective data, we don't have very much, very many uh, objective pieces of data. So our big idea really, and actually, and so before I get onto this, and most providers were really, the way I'm trained, I'm trained to elicit a history, then do a physical exam in a very specific order. And um, I don't know how to practice medicine across a video link. Just never received any training. And those vital signs in physical exam, they're, they're very important to me. Um, and most of my colleagues. So we had this, the, our big idea was that perhaps we could kind of create a new type of telemedicine that would help specifically in COVID. And as a first step, um, start developing tools that could kind of give us information about the physical exam, about the patient assessment, and ultimately diagnose um, uh, entities, whether it be COVID or otherwise, and maybe make predictions about, about decompensation in COVID patients or other uh, types, of, uh, types of patients. 
Next slide. Okay, so that's next is, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, okay. So our, uh, our immediate objective in this project, uh, uh, motivated by the problem that David just um, presented, um, is about vital signs. We want to develop a system that would estimate the vitals. And of course, all of this is now in the context of remote. So we are doing this remotely. So uh, our approach that we are taking in this uh, uh, project is to use multiple sensors, integrate inputs from multiple sensors. And it's very important to do that because as I, when I would describe the state of the art, we'll find out that there are lots of small isolated narrow scope projects. Some of them perform to the desired level of uh, accuracy, et cetera, and some don't. However, we really want a system and not a whole bunch of instruments. And our plan to validate them is <clears throat> through the uh, monitors that the emergency departments use, as well as the reviews uh, uh, carried out by physicians. And then we want to deploy them at the two hospitals, UIC hospital and UC hospital to test them out. Uh, the, the specific vitals we are targeting uh, and the physical exams we are targeting and the other lab tests are listed here. The, we have estimation of vital signs and physical exam in other labs. Among the vital signs, we are, we are going for blood pressure, heart rate, respiration rate, oxygen saturation level, and temperature. And in the physical exam and other lab set, we have scleral discoloration, the changes in the colors of the white part of the eye, uh, jaundice, pallor, cyanosis, hydration, hemoglobin level, wheezing, and wet or dry cough. So these we would want to be able to do through an integrated system, which is more or less uh, usable by the person, by the patient, without any professional instructions and real-time help. The kind of traits obviously we want to have uh, because we are not dealing with now sitting with the doctor and with IT professionals. We would want the system to be valid, uh, accurate, reliable, consistent, non-intrusive, usable by ordinary people, easy to do work with remotely, affordable. Affordable basically means that we should be able to use commodity hardware and software. It should be fast and scalable. And our goal in the beginning, uh, obviously, is to, to sort of um, for it to become an assistant to the physicians. Uh, and as the trust builds, as the performance is found to be satisfactory or is improved as needed, then it will find its way into more uh, regular, more dominant, uh, play, you know, play a, a bigger role. But that would be up to the system itself. Uh, now, uh, let me just quickly give you a, a state of the art summary. And I will kind of rush through this because there is, there is a not tremendous amount of work, but there is reasonable amount of work. So I'll just give you a sense of where we are, not the details of the papers. First of all, the vitals are the heart rate, the respiration rate, the blood pressure, and the dissolved oxygen. And uh, the methods, the methods that are uh, used uh, are spectral or movement-based uh, for the heart rate and similar sources, motion, color, um, uh, temperature change. These are the methods, basically color change, motion, or thermal properties. Those are typically the, the, the sources of information used by people who have done work on this 
and of course audio features, not just visual, but audio features. So as I mentioned earlier, that we want to do integrated estimation uh, for a one-stop multi-vital measurement system. So for that, we'll need to use a number of a number of uh, 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 parts of the body, which which give us information about various vitals that we are after. Uh, let me start with uh, heart rate. So heart rate is uh, 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 different sources are used. Color is one uh, where you look at see heart rate is periodic uh, phenomenon. So you look at some some period periodic uh, a cue that is visible, which is directly related to the to the beating heart. And one thing is that as heart beats, the blood rushes to various parts of the body, and so the volume uh, that movement is periodic. And you can see that in the change in uh, uh, appearance of uh, body parts, for example, face or neck or wrist. You can do that in RGB, or you can do it in near infrared. And um, if you can just detect that wave, then uh, you can estimate the heart rate. Uh, and I must mention that anything periodic is al always uh, nice because you have opportunity to uh, use laws of large law of large numbers. You know, you can you're observing the same thing again and again and again, so your error can go down over time. Um, then from ocean, uh, the blood flowing to an organ periodically. And so uh, what people have done is used forehead and lips, wrist, neck in the, the carotid artery. You select a region, you see how it moves and look for period there. Audio also, you can hear the heart beating. So you can do various frequency domain operations, bandpass filtering, and the bandpass will decide that you will be looking for looking at the band that corresponds to the heart rate or corresponds to the uh, breathing phenomenon. And so you do the frequency analysis, just do bandpass, detect envelope, look at the periodicity, look at the peak. So uh, uh, very, I mean, in different bands like this. So it's, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, next, let's look at uh, uh, respiration rate. You can do that from chest motion. If you have a depth camera of some sort, whether it's depth camera or stereo or something where you can estimate depth, then respiration corresponds to periodic variation in the chest depth. And so you can do these contours and, and measure the variation in depth around some mean at different points on the chest. And so you can get the um, estimate from there. Uh, then from uh, uh, another kind of motion where you see muscle motion, which is the result of, for example, blood flow plus breathing intermixed. So you look at the skin deformation, skin movement in the image, and then you somehow do some component analysis, separation, source separation. So you separate the respiration and heart rate components. And again, neck, carotid artery, and face are the are the sources of information that are used. And I have not been mentioning the, but the errors at the bottom are the errors that are state of the art. Uh, so 0.24 uh, cycles missed per minute and uh, 0.36 beats per minute. These are the mean absolute errors. I didn't refer to those earlier, but those are also present for the other ones. Mm. Then, uh, uh, from color, you can also do the respiration rate of, um, you know, obviously, because again, the as you breathe in and out, there is change in temperature, uh, which leads to color. But in this case, it's so, so the color changes uh, as a result of inhalation and exhalation. And you can again measure the, the, this periodicity in the neck area at the pit of the neck. Um, you can sense temperature instead of changing the color, uh, noticing the color as a result of uh, breathing. Uh, you see periodicity when you inhale, there is one temperature. When you exhale, uh, no, at the nose, you have another temperature. Again, you detect periods and they occur in, in pairs because inspiration, expiration. 
uh, are on alternate. So the current state of the art is 0 0.33, 0 0.33 cycles lost, missed or error, mean absolute error. From audio, uh, again, you can listen to the um, lungs also. You can do time and frequency analysis. If you are given breathing signal alone, uh, then you can do this identification of inspiration and expiration by spectrogram. But uh, more interesting result, recent result is that people did just simply speech. They didn't know no breathing, just speech. And from the speech they learned using ground truth, what the actual respiration rate was and, and uh, ground truth. So they trained a neural net to separate the, uh, the breathing part from the background or the dominant part of speech. And from the, they could learn to estimate um, respiration uh, rate from the mix signal. Uh, let's go to blood pressure. Blood pressure, again, you can do from, from uh, color change. As, uh, uh, as the blood reaches the, uh, the for example, the, the palm or the forehead, uh, you, you can uh, uh, again tell when the blood has reached. So again, there is a periodicity wherever you're observing. Uh, then uh, let's look at dissolved oxygen. Uh, here, uh, the basic idea is that uh, if you have more oxygen or less oxygen, then the reflectivity is affected. If you look at the red and near infrared components, absorption at those two wavelengths, for example, this is one, this is another. And so in one of these cases, near in the infrared, the uh, one of the uh, uh, cases is detected more strongly, there's more reflection. In the other, there's uh, the uh, red component is higher or the NIR component, which is blue here, or uh, is higher, uh, which is these two wavelengths. And these are the two cases with oxygen, without oxygen. So you can just simply tell by the polarity of things, which is higher, which is lower, uh, say something about the oxygen level. Um, you can also do that by the movement of the, um, so you, if you illuminate the eye with, uh, with laser, uh, of course, some this laser, uh, then the, the, the micro saccades can be detected. Micro saccades actually relate to oxygen level. So if you illuminate by laser, you get a speckle pattern, you look at the movement amplitude, and that tells you something about oxygen level. So that also has been done. Um, so the... Uh, this, this is a, a, some of the, these are examples of, of the uh, vitals. Now I'll, uh, Mark, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, Mark, can you take over and talk about the wet and dry cough? Sure, let me just talk about two background pieces and then two of the, the um, uh, pieces of work that we've been, that we've been doing. So, in, so I'm going to talk about uh, wet and dry, the uh, discrimination between wet and dry cough and, um, and also the discrimination of wheezing versus non-wheezing audio. And both of these are essentially uh, classification problems. The only thing that makes them really difficult is that the, um, the input observation is of such ridiculously high dimension. It, uh, um, we, we don't know in advance how many frames we're going to get, but if we trim it at one, one second with 512 uh, observation, uh, uh, dimensional FFT once every 10 milliseconds, that's a lot of data. And so the way that that problem has been solved, that problem has been solved in largely two different ways in the literature. First of all, on this slide, um, we're demonstrating a system. We've shown here the spectrogram, but um, but the feature set that was uh, that was found to be most effective was an open source feature set published in in, in at Munich called the Open Smile feature set. This is a set. This basically pushes the task of dimensionality reduction into the feature extraction stage, where a series of low-level desc uh, descriptors, including, um, including Mel filter bank energies, and including um, MFCCs, F0, formant frequencies, and, and other low-level descriptors, um, are each treated as uh, functions of time. 
and those functions of time are described are, are described by higher level functional descriptors. This functional analysis then generates a feature vector that's about 7,000 features long, which can then be classified using uh, um, any standard high dimensional uh, classification engine, such as a random forest or a support vector machine. Next slide, please. The other approach, of course, to using very high dimensional inputs is a convolutional neural network. And um, the state of the art in wheezing recognition uses a convolutional neural network applied to the spectrogram in order to, um, in order to distinguish between wheezing and non-wheezing signals. Next slide, please. So some of the work that um, we've been doing uh, that's not about these biomedical signals, but that um, we believe will be um, applicable in, in trying to build algorithms for this include, um, the next slide, include, um, first of all, the separation of speech into, um, into orthogonal component, not orthogonal components, but um, conditionally independent components, representing the rhythm, the pitch, the content and the timbre or, or speaker, uh, speaker's voice quality. And this is done by training um, an autoencoder with, uh, with four different inputs. And the four different inputs are each distorted in some way that limits the kind of information that can be reconstructed from that input. So um, the, uh, uh, the input to the pitch encoder, for example, only has the F0 trajectory as a function of time. The input to the content encoder has um, random, uh, random stretching and shrinking of the, of the time axis in order to force the content encoder to not learn about rhythm. And by, uh, by training, the, training the bottleneck layers with um, different kinds of distorted inputs, we can separate out the rhythm, content, pitch, and speaker voice quality of the input speech and then change any one of those. We can take audio from one speaker and uh, change the rhythm with which that person speaks, or we can change their voice to someone else's voice, or we can change their prosody so that they produce pitch accents in exactly the place that some other person has produced pitch accents while not changing the voice at the same time. So these, this allows us to do, for example, an analysis into features. One of the features that we've developed in a separate project is shown on the next slide that we're going to just click to. This is um, approximated auditory roughness. Auditory roughness is a feature that was um, that came actually out of the perceptual psychophysics literature. It's um, essentially uh, frequency modulation of the voice in a, in a band around 70 to 80 hertz. So this is a, um, a, a frequency that's not perceived by humans as being um, as being contentful like syllables. But it's also not perceived by humans as being um, as being spectral, like like formants. Instead, it's somewhere in between. It just sounds like roughness. And this was originally proposed for scream detection. And um, and one of Deming's students, working with one of my students about three years ago, developed an approximated auditory roughness measure that was used exactly for that, for de detecting um, scream, distinguishing um, uh, uh, movie movie uh, tracks that contained screams versus those that didn't. Um, independent of the volume of the um, at which it was played back, um, we've uh, we've recently been taking this particular feature and using it, for example, to distinguish between um, different infant vocalizations between crying and fussing and laughing and babbling and, and screeching in um, in infant vocalizations, and it it does a good job of this because it's um, it's a a measure of the de the degree to which humans hear something harsh in the in the voice of the input. Narendra, I think you're still muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Great. Okay, so uh, I will just I will uh, go over uh, a similar example that Mark just gave about the kind of work that we have been doing recently, which uh, which would be very which is useful for what we are doing for vitals. This is an example of <clears throat> embedding. Uh, hierarchical image structure into the algorithms and using them for learning uh, where the a general purpose like auditory signal a general purpose structural description of the images kept bringing out different uh, details uh, in different cases uh,
uh, here is another example where you give input as video frames and output is the sequence of 3D pose sequence. From video frames, you get people's 3D uh, poses uh, as a function of time. So for example, here you have the joint 3D poses represented by the positions, 3D positions of the joints. And as video, uh, as time changes, the joint positions change. And our goal is to go from video to 3D post sequence. So here is an example of how that is useful. Here, uh, uh, Dr. Wisniak is demonstrating what uh, the gate of, uh, in, in case of uh, a cerebral, cerebral disease looks like. And so what we want to do is to use that information to estimate um, uh, truncal instability, lurching, and you know, fearing and falling and relate that to the health. So for example, here we have the input is a video frame. Output would be a 3D sequence. So here is a video frame, video sequence. And we estimate the 3D positions of the joints as a function of time. And uh, uh, by analyzing the nature of the movement, hopefully we can get something about the, the disease, specific disease. Here is another example where we are talking about uh, generating uh, missing frames. So you have input video coming in, the frame, there are some frames which are missing, but audio is continuous. So knowing that we, what the relationship is between uh, in image, uh, images and audio, when we have the audio, we can try and fill in the images from the related audio information. And these are the image frames that we have produced as a result of learning the relationship between input um, video and audio, and then filling in the missing information. Okay, so let me um, get to the uh, learning part of it. it uh, we have been working on, uh, it's not published yet, but hopefully we'll be doing uh, uh, publishing it soon. We have been working on some architectures, alternative architectures for CNNs, uh, which are more interpretable or tractable. That, that means you can you can actually talk about the um, algorithmic or, or or equation form where you can say what exactly is going on. As a result, you can optimally design them, so you can relate it to what you want and design them sort of for that uh, case uh, that you're trying to solve. And we want them to be compact, uh, compact meaning uh, the description is small so that you can think of um, pushing them to the edge uh, in devices of the kind that we are targeting here, for example, for remote health. So this is, these are guide, guiding, you know, guidelines for our design of the learning uh, architecture, which we will be using for this uh, uh, problem. Now, David, are you there? Yes, I am. Yeah, can you do the Yeah, questions? so it, it's very important, I guess, from the um, acceptability standpoint uh, of this project for these, um, any systems that we develop uh, to be kind of understandable by providers. Uh, there's a, a long history of kind of AI clinical decision rules and, and um, predictive algorithms that have not been ad adopted because um, they offer black box solutions, which typically when we're talking about human life and medical liability are not particularly uh, 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 important. So uh, I would definitely concur, I guess, with, uh, with Narendra's uh, uh, plan here is we need to make it kind of interpretable. So our general plan just to gather data will be to get samples from a, about 150 patients at the University of Illinois, Chicago and University of Chicago emergency departments. Um, and we will, what we'll do is we'll be looking for patients who have uh, the diagnosis of COVID or other respiratory complaints. Uh, we realized in executing this that getting kind of primary data for this would be kind of uh, potentially difficult 
depending on which phase of the pandemic we're in locally. Um, and so to, I, I think anything that we learn about respiratory complaints in general will be applicable to COVID patients specifically. Uh, we've spent time developing a standardized uh, procedure or kind of uh, telemedicine exam um, that uh, will help us elic elicit uh, physical exam findings from the patients. And we'll be doing that um, uh, kind of uh, re semi-remotely. So the patients will be uh, performing the maneuvers on themselves. We will be uh, taking audiovisual samples uh, from them, uh, but instructing them on these procedures from the, the outside of the, uh, the emergency department room. Um, and yeah, I guess the, the next hurdle is getting IRB approval to do this. And uh, we're getting very close to that at this point and hope to have IRB approval by uh, end of February and then be uh, collecting information. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, we're you know, uh, uh, collecting information on kind of uh, our, our PIs and co-Is uh, as, as a first step. Thanks, Dave. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yeah. So the, the, let me just quickly summarize what we are planning to do in the next six months. We want to have this estimation algorithm and system ready. We want to have tested it on patient data that uh, we are collecting that David just mentioned. Uh, we want to validate that using ground truth, which is also collect, being collected at the uh, 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 along with the data, and um, and then a framework for using the results, how, how we can bring it to practice. So the final result we are hoping is a system to enable clinicians with remote monitoring of vital health parameters. And uh, I will, given the time, I think I'll just quickly rush through what we want to do beyond the vital estimation. So vital estimation is kind of a milestone what we want to do beyond that is to enhance the scope, broaden the scope of the system uh, with both uh, vital estimation, that means monitoring, but also diagnosis, prediction, and communication of health status. All of them are you know, uh, challenging. And again, as I mentioned earlier, using commodity tools, for example, over a virtual telecom link, and uh, validated by physicians and, equip and equipment for you know, measurements <clears throat> and test deployed at UIC and UC hospitals. Um, and that will be important to, to reduce the, uh, the load, you know, the, the, need, the demand for, for uh, patient beds. Quickly, a couple of examples of what kind of diagnosis we are thinking of. Uh, we want to be able to detect, for example, migraine. Uh, in this case, it is from asymmetric change in blood pressure, blood perfusion. This is, a, uh, this is work already in existence. You simply look at the blood flow directions and if they're asymmetric, then it is indicative of stress. Oh, sorry, indicative of migraine. And then stress, um, you have change in heart rate pattern. And we all know that. Uh, so again, do time frequency analysis, simple things of heart rate. In this case, we are using vital. In this case, we are not using vital, we are using um, direct blood flow. So this is where we are. Uh, uh, and we do have it's, uh, time for questions. If there are any. Thank you, Narendra. It was a very nice talk, very ambitious project. Um, I, there are a few questions in um, the q and A. I I think this, uh, they moved to the answered part, but I guess they've not been even asked yet. Um, I guess the first question is, uh, what role do smartwatches like Apple Watch play? Maybe Apple support equal to win-win. I guess the broader question is that, uh, so you mentioned a whole bunch of, a bunch of uh, uh, sensory readings and how to interpret them. I guess the question is, where do you get this information from? Just purely, you know, it can't just be purely on a video conference. If you, the doctor's not just looking at you, but I guess the question is, are they, are they supposed to be wearing something? Are they, are they using some other devices to aid in the uh, diagnosis? Or, uh, so, so yeah, what, what does the entire system look like? Yeah. 
I'd be happy to take that actually, Narendra. Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. So yeah, I, there's all sorts of wearable devices from Apple Watches, uh, Fitbits, uh, and, and, and a whole assortment of, of wearables, consumer wearables that are harvesting health information. Uh, I think from our perspective, at, at least if we're talking about Apple Watches uh, specifically, um, we're trying to make this something that can be deployed over just a smartphone at this point because we want to have the broadest appeal and I, I and I think the challenge of doing this with non-contact kind of uh, doing kind of a non-contact almost passive approach to collection of these uh, vital signs I think would be innovative. Uh, Apple Watch, you know, has you know, um, and and other sensors can be helpful, but right now they're just the adoption rate is just you know much lower than would be kind of uh, useful, especially in the population that I work in work with uh, down here at the University of Chicago. Uh, so not that many Apple watches, watches deployed at this point, though everybody has a smartphone um, and almost everybody has a data plan at this point. Okay, if you watch, look at the Pew, the, the Pew statistics on smartphone adoption rates, uh, it's just every, every year uh, it's increasing. Uh, we're into the linear phase, obviously at this point, but we're getting you know close to 90% and that's across almost every age demographic, except at the very ends of the age demographics. So so you're saying that it's, it'll be using just the audio and video portions of a cell phone, that's it. So so for example, PPG, I know people put their finger on the camera and, and do that, but, but for other things, I guess you would, you would, I guess, put the phone in front of you or something like that, and then, and then take a video of yourself and then send it to the doctor. Is that what you have in mind? The, yeah, the idea is that we would be able to kind of uh, get vital signs and hopefully other kind of physical assessment uh, information just from the video signal, the okay. audio video signal. Okay. Also, you know, the, the Apple Watch uh, is, is great, but it is, it is restricted in terms of what it can collect. Now, okay. there is, um, it can collect those a few, you know, heartbeat, et cetera, blood pressure. But uh, when you're looking at a picture or you're listening to somebody, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words and a word is worth a thousand, I don't know, Apple Watch signals. So there is this information increase right. Right. and somehow you have to pull that out. Great, uh, excellent. So so I think there are two questions by John Talon. I guess the previous question was by Ariad Engelbrecht. This, the next two questions are from John Talon. Um, is John Rogers making a system that can measure vital signs? He may be doing that. If not, he's close to such a system. Uh, I guess it seems more like a comment. I don't know if you know about this or not. And uh, the second one is just a comment saying the SPO2 meter and BP instruments both give the heart rate. But I guess that you have already answered. You just want to use the cell phone to do all of this. But do you know anything about what John Rogers is doing? Or No, uh, I think, I, I don't know the details, but I think his, uh, uh, yeah, I, I should... I, I'm not sure, 100% sure what he's doing. Okay, okay. But I have a suspicion he will have uh, material properties also. Some biochemical might be there, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I think the next two questions are related to the previous questions by the same uh, two people. I took Apple as an example because we need a standardized error range, not too many models as that means too much error variation. I'm not sure I fully parsing the question. I don't know if you understand the question, Narendra. Can you repeat that again? I took Apple as an example, um, also because we need a standardized error range, not too many models as that means too much error variation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that is, that is, a, that is a good, good comment, but it applies to only as much as Apple Watch can do. So this, this need, this requirement that there should be, you know, something that one can say about the error bounds, yes. But then we want to be able to do that for a broader range of things. Uh, for example, I mean, can you quick immediately detect um, uh, uh, depression, stress? You know, those may be hard to. It, it's 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 uh, you cannot say it's not there. Information is not there in those signals that Apple Watch is detecting. But then having multiple sensors and being able to integrate them, uh, you just simply improve the on the one hand detectability but even more and, and equally the error. 
So if you have multiple sources, the error will go down. And it's even possible that you cannot do it with if you don't have visual or audio. Or audio. But this is you know, something that we have to find out. Great. Okay. The final question. Um, getting the ground truth regarding your measures is really important. Maybe the methods of John Rogers would be helpful in getting ground truth data. But I guess you're, you're planning to do this at the hospitals, right? So that would be one way to sort of get yeah. ground truth. Is that, is that really good yeah. ground truth? We'll be in a monitored setting. Yeah. Uh, all these patients will be hooked up to monitors. And so we'll be getting the monitor data, which I think will provide us with a, a, nice, a nice advantage. Right. So the trust is a big issue, you know, here. So if you don't, even if you get the ground truth, which is correct, you have to do it in a way which is already established, accepted, you know, these instruments. So only when we say that these instruments are doing the same thing that we are doing, can they, you know, will there be a right. uh, trust? Thank you very much. We're uh, almost at the top of the hour. And thank you very much for uh, the wonderful talk by all three of you. Uh, I guess we can applaud you, you. easily. But thank, but thank you. And, and uh, I hope to see everyone again at next week's colloquium. Bye. Bye. Bye.